Hello, everyone. My name is Dominica Murphy, and I am the Community Director of Surround Health. I wanted to send a very warm welcome to everyone here uh, for joining us today for our webinar on how to engage patients from multicultural backgrounds. We have a terrific turnout today with um, over 400 healthcare professionals from around the country who registered. So again, welcome to all of you, and also a really terrific panel of speakers who are ready with an informative presentation just for you. Uh, today's panelists include Dr. Catherine Margolis from Health at Academy. She'll be discussing the overall findings from the Health at Academy survey on engaging patients from multicultural backgrounds. We also have that Dr. Catherine Malbin from Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center, and she'll be presenting about her program, Text in the City. We also have Dr. Georgia Sadler um, from University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, who will be discussing her work with multicultural patients as it relates to clinical trials and clinical trial recruitment. And last but not least, we have Zul Sarani from the Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, University of Southern California, who will be sharing his approach at, that he takes at USC for patient education and community outreach to reduce cancer disparities. So um, just a couple of things for you to keep in mind. We will um, have a question and answer period at the end of the webinar. So if there are any questions for any of our panelists, simply type them into the questions section in the webinar control panel to the right of your screen, and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, we will also be tweeting during the webinar. So if you're on Twitter, we hope that you join us um, using the hashtag SHWebinar. If there are any issues or questions, um, you can email us at communitymanager at surroundhealth.net. And we're also providing one CHES and one RD credit for this webinar. So please be sure to complete the feedback survey at the end to receive those. Um, we hope you get a lot out of today's webinar. And now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Catherine Margolis. Great. Thank you so much, Dominica. I'm so excited to be part of this webinar. The first thing that I'm going to be doing is talking about um, findings from a new report that was released from Health Ed Academy, and it's about engaging patients from multicultural backgrounds. And if any of you have any questions, we're going to be holding them at the end, like Dominica said, so you can either type them in now or email them, and we'll be sure to answer them at the end. So the report that we're going to be talking about is called Engaging Patients from Multicultural Backgrounds. And it, what it was, was it was looking at how healthcare extenders are engaging with patients from different backgrounds and finding out their challenges and strategies for addressing and overcoming these challenges. So today I'm going to go through the main findings, and then the panelists will talk about some of the strategies that they use to address these challenges. I'm only going to be able to go over the high-level findings just to keep time in mind, but happy to address any questions that we have at the end. So the first question that we get asked a lot is, why did we do this survey? You know, how did we decide to do it? Well, one of the reasons that we did it was the ongoing demographic change in the U.S. So right now, the U.S. Census is um, predicting that about 51% of those born in the U.S. currently are born to a minority group. And so we're going to see the diversity continue to increase. We also know that there's evidence of persistent health care disparities. So different people are receiving different treatment and having different outcomes. And then also, as we all know, we're in the midst of a sweeping health care transformation. So because of these reasons, we really thought it was a really important time to examine this issue. We also have gotten feedback from the first report we did that many of you were interested in this topic. So based on that, we decided to conduct a survey with healthcare extenders or those people who work in the medical field that they're not MDs, but they're working directly with patients, offering counseling, helping them. It may be nurses, um, diabetes educators, patient educators, those types of people. So we surveyed a group of them, and we ended up with 192 healthcare extenders from all over the United States. Um, in fact, we had 37 states represented. We had people that worked in outpatient settings, in hospitals, private practice or consulting, and corporate or off-site wellness facilities. And we found that 83% of those who completed our survey were white, which may seem like a high percentage, but that actually reflects the overall population of healthcare extenders in the U.S. And 63% were fluent only in English. A wide range of ages were represented, 18 to 70 plus. 
And then we also asked respondents what types of patients they serve. And we found that 88% sometimes work with patients from cultures different than their own. And 79% often or sometimes work with patients who have limited English proficiency. So we really got a broad range um, of people to complete the survey and give us their answers and strategies. All right, so now we're going to go right into the key findings. So there's seven overall. The first key finding that we had was that language barriers and concerns about patient comprehension are the top two challenges that healthcare extenders face in providing culturally competent care. So when we did the survey, about half, or 48% of respondents said they often or sometimes experience a situation in which language differences prevent effective communication between them and their patients or caregivers. And then 44% report that they often or sometimes are uncertain about how to best educate a patient or family member due to cultural differences. So we have a large number of respondents reporting that they are facing challenges with language and comprehension when treating their patients. And then finding number two, what we found was that minority patients' discomfort in the healthcare setting is a primary barrier. And that's one that has a variety of solutions. So when we asked our healthcare extenders about the barriers that they face, 36% mentioned challenges related to making patients feel comfortable in the healthcare setting. Other barriers they faced were communication and language barriers, a lack of appropriate resources for marketing, patient education and outreach, limited familiarity with lifestyle and religious beliefs of patients or a limited understanding of their cultures, and limited availability of staffing interpreters and outreach workers. So they really are reporting back that they're facing a lot of different challenges and that they have a variety of solutions. And we'll hear some of them from our other speakers a little bit later on. But what we can do is if we look at this graph here, we see some of the strategies that they reported for reaching patients from diverse backgrounds. So you can see the top strategy that they reported was they provide culturally appropriate patient education materials. So 69% of respondents are doing this. 52% are recruiting staff that reflect the populations that they serve. 46% are tailoring programs and services, and all the way down to marketing services to different ethnic communities. So you can see there really are a wide range of strategies that our healthcare extenders are reporting that they're using to reach patients from diverse backgrounds. So then if we go to finding number three, we found that healthcare extenders know how to provide culturally competent care, but unfortunately they can't always take the proactive steps that they would like. So what we asked them about this, they said that when working with culturally diverse patients to foster treatment adherence, 80% report being challenged by either working collaboratively, overcoming language barriers and health literacy issues, helping patients understand their condition and their treatment regimen, working with patients whose health beliefs and practices are inconsistent with common Western medical practices, or helping patients access community resources for healthy eating and exercises. So these are some of the challenges that they're reporting back when they try to work with culturally diverse patients to foster treatment adherence. The next finding that we found dealt with languages. So finding number four found there was such a wide array of languages that are being spoken in this country, and this revealed a need for educational resources in many languages. So we asked patients what other languages that they needed, and we gave them a list of the 10 most common languages that the census reports, and 4 in 10 actually selected other. So it was additional languages beyond those most 10 common languages that are spoken. And then if we look at um, this chart that we have here, it shows just the wide array of languages, and that Spanish is just the beginning for language needs. So we can see on here how many different languages that people are looking for. So English is 95% and Spanish is right there at 94%. But then we have this whole array of languages that are also being spoken. So Hindi, Punjabi, Cambodian, Indonesian, French Creole, Arabic. You can see there's just a large number of languages and a truly diverse patient population. And so we really get at that there is this critical need for multilingual patient education. In fact, about half of the people that we surveyed didn't have access to patient educational materials in the languages that they need. And the most common languages that they said were Southeast Asian languages, Creole, Indian Pakistani languages, Chinese, and Spanish. And then when we asked them what language materials they needed, so what languages do they need materials in, the same percentage that said Spanish also said Chinese. So we see really, you know, a lot of times 
translations is, are offered really in Spanish, but it's moving much more beyond Spanish, the needs that people have. And 42% of respondents are translating patient educational materials into other languages. So we really see that language is playing a key role um, in how healthcare centers are able to reach and educate patients. So finding number five found that respondents continue to rely on high touch, not necessarily high tech. So nearly three in 10 healthcare extenders report that they don't use technology or social media to engage culturally diverse patients, or that they don't see benefits in doing so. They say that they have barriers for this, and some of those barriers include a patient's lack of access technology, patient's limited digital literacy, or language barriers. So they're continuing to rely on high touch methods. In fact, when we take a look at exactly what they are using, we, we found that um, in person was the most common. So one on one was the most common in the form of patient education. About 88% reported doing that. And then we continue to have more high touch in person materials like print materials, group classes, or workshops. All the way down to you can see only text messaging is only being really used by 4%. So patient education is still very personal. And then finding number six, we found that when creating patient education materials, healthcare extenders involve minority community members less often than they involve providers. So when they're creating materials, they really are seeking help from other healthcare providers and not necessarily patients. And one in three reported developing their own patient resources often or sometimes. And then if we look at this next infographic, you can see exactly how often they're involving people and who they're involving. So um, respondents, when they're creating their own healthcare materials, really are involving other healthcare providers. 43% said they often do, 32% said sometimes. And then we ask them how often they're involving patients. 11% said often, and 29% said sometimes. And you can see much bigger numbers here for seldom and never. And then when we ask respondents um, about involving community partners or key st stakeholders in development of patient education materials, again, only 11% are often doing it and 28 are sometimes doing it. But much more commonly, it's either not happening or seldom happening that they're involving community partners or key stakeholders when they're developing patient education materials. And so that brings us to finding number seven, the last finding of this report. And that found that patient education is delivered in many community locations, but it's rarely delivered at pharmacies. So most healthcare extenders are delivering educational services at various sites. So they reported lots of different places that they're doing so. And they most often are choosing places based on convenience for the patients and input from the community leaders, but it's really not often happening at the pharmacy. So we found that 25% do not believe that they have a good understanding of the programs and services available within their community. So we asked them about, you know, if they're referring their patients to other programs and services, and 25% really just don't have a firm understanding about what's available in terms of different health, social, and educational programs, and so they're not able to refer their patients. All right, so now it's time for our first quick poll. So what we'd like you to do is to select how much these findings that I just talked about relate to your own experiences. So do these key seven findings that we found in this report relate back to how much, to what you're experiencing? So you can select anything from strongly agree to strongly disagree. I'll give you a minute to select and then we'll talk about what we're finding. And remember, if you do have any questions based on any of the findings, please feel free to type them in or email them. Um, and we will make sure that we address those at the end after all of the other speakers. And also remember that you can follow along with Twitter using the hashtag that we talked about earlier. All right, in just about 15 more seconds, we're going to close down the poll. I'm getting an early glimpse at the numbers here, and not to spoil anything, but it looks like most of you are agreeing with the findings that we've gotten in this report. All right, so um, hopefully you can all see that 28% uh, of you said strongly agree, and 57% of you said that you agree that these findings do relate to your own experiences. So it seems like the report was pretty reflective of what you're also experiencing. 
So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Catherine Malvin, who she's going to be talking about some of the programs and things that she does, and particularly she's going to be talking about her experiences relating back to our finding number five about high touch and high tech. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Malvin at this time. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so actually many of those findings um, are certainly um, barriers that, that we experience in the adolescent clinic where I work in, um, in New York. Um, but the point coming out of the report that healthcare extenders rely on high touch rather than high tech, so number five, very much resonates in my experience. Now, I'm not actually getting the slides up. Hello? Yes, Dr. Melvin, I just flipped them for you. Do you see the slides? No. Okay, one second, I apologize. There we are. Sorry about that. Perfect. Okay. Um, so um, I work in an adolescent health center, um, which is a nonprofit affiliated with Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Um, and we see about 11,000 youth annually. Um, they are largely kids of color um, from poor areas of New York. And we see ourselves as a, as a one-stop shop. So we have lots of um, facilities here. We have a, a large mental health um, component, and um, we have nutritionists, um, social workers. Um, so when an adolescent comes in just for something like a sore throat, we try and address multiple um, uh, issues. And obviously what comes from that is a lot of, that they need a lot of health education. So when I first started working here uh, three or four years ago, um, just walking through the waiting area, I noticed that so many of these teens were on their cell phones. Um, and they would be on their cell phones, not only in the waiting area, but they'd bring them into the clinic room with them. You'd be examining them, and they'd be still on their cell phones. And so, you know, it was hard to, to kind of engage with them because they're on their cell phones so much. But then the other thing that really uh, was very apparent was that there was so much health education to deliver to these teenagers in such a short space of time. As you can imagine, if we're trying to do so much in one visit, um, there isn't time to tell them absolutely everything they need to know. And they're actually really thirsty for knowledge. So um, I decided to kind of put two and two thing, uh, together and come up with a program um, that would be able to educate the, the teens via their cell phones. And cell phones we know are ubiquitous in the adolescent population. About 98% of um, teens say they own a cell phone. They're also, um, they reach all demographics. And the great thing about text messaging is that you can send one message to many um, it's relatively private, and adolescents have their cell phones with them all the time. There's been some recent literature out which you know, shows that adolescents are sleeping with their cell phones. Um, and cell phones are relatively cheap compared to other technologies. So two years ago, I did some focus groups. Um, and it was very apparent that teens really didn't know where to go to get their education. As I said, they have a kind of thirst for knowledge, um, but they don't know what's re reliable and what's trustworthy. They use Google to search, and then they don't know what link to click on. And many um, websites which are talking about things they want to know about are, are very kind of dry. You know, they'll go to renowned websites um, which end in .gov, um, but it, it's largely aimed at healthcare professionals rather than teens. I'm just trying to move my slide on, and I can't move it on either. Oh, there we go. Um, I also did a survey of patients in the waiting area uh, to see if they actually wanted to use their cell phones to engage with the healthcare provider. And it was overwhelmingly positive results. So many of them already had unlimited text, so there wasn't really a cost involved for them in, in sending or receiving text messages. Um, and they 
thought that they would respond quicker to text. They even wanted results via text. Um, and they weren't that concerned about confidentiality. So this really helped us shape our program. Um, so it started in 2010. And because we knew that teams wanted uh, a source of reliable, trustworthy um, health education, we established a chat function where they could ask in a question and they could uh, have it responded to by a, a doctor within 24 hours. Um, we also developed a health bite, so this covers a, a whole range of adolescent um, issues. Um, we send a snippet of health education out once a week on a Thursday afternoon. And then we set up birth control reminders because we were constantly hearing from our teenagers that they kept forgetting to take their birth control. And as we know that most um, unwanted pregnancies are the result of failed or improper use of birth control, we wanted to um, be, have the ability to give these reminders to the team. Um, as you can imagine, setting something up like this um, in a kind of very well, long-established um, adolescent clinic um, was not easy. Um, we had quite a few hoops to jump through, both in terms of um, legality um, and in changing providers' behaviors. Um, so, but it, it was possible. And um, we spoke to the lawyers at Mount Sinai Hospital. They, they helped us with some of the um, promotion material. Um, so we had to include things on that promotion material to make teams aware that you know, this was them opting in to ask a question. And so they had to make sure that their cell phone was password protected and that it was their cell phone and they had it with them at all times. And we encouraged them to delete their text message once they'd read it. Um, the other big body of people to convince were the other providers within the, the Adolescent Healthcare Center. And I think, really, it was just educating them about the fact that you know this this was safe and this was a good thing for teenagers that we were going to really help educate them um, and so you know dispel a lot of myths around um, text messaging that that these other providers kind of had had perceived. So um, as you can see from the numbers, the, the really the most popular function um, is the chat function. So we get a lot of questions. Um, following a patient's visit. And it's really not just for the patients in clinic. You know, we encourage them to uh, get their friends using it. Um, so it, it really can be anyone. And we don't know who those questions are coming from because it's entirely confidential. All we see is, a, is um, the question come in. We don't actually see the cell number or the person it's been sent from. The um, birth control reminders, um, we had a lot of feedback from patients saying that they would actually like medication reminders, not just birth control. And this is really interesting to us. Um, obviously, we give out other medications such as antibiotics, um, short courses of steroids. Uh, and so they wanted the ability to just put in reminders for um, a short period of time. And then we also have an HIV positive population. And they really wanted the ability to put in a once-a-day reminder at a time that they wanted. Um, and actually, only yesterday, I was contacted by somebody who was looking after an adolescent who'd had a liver transplant and was on multiple medications. And um, this patient wanted to be able to use the medication reminders um, in, in the way that you know, was personalized for him. So we added that, uh, that extra function. Now, going back to the, the chat questions, you can see from this that they're largely reproductive and sexual health related. And many of them are about birth control. And we know that birth control is really pretty complex to understand um, for adults, let alone teenagers. And we give many teens uh, birth control in the clinic. And we know that when they come back two or three months later, they're not taking it. And we think that's largely because you know they just 
go, they haven't been able to absorb that information that you've given them in the clinic. And when they get home, they just kind of panic and don't know how, when, um, what to do with it. Um, so, so this was, you know, really kind of quite an enlightening finding that maybe we needed to think a little more about how we are counselling these teenagers um, when they start a birth control. And also just think about other kind of innovative ways that we can help them stay on their birth control. So four key take-home points. Um, I think uh, the, uh, the main message that basically I've learned from, from starting Tech in the City is that you really need to know who you're catering your program for. It's really tempting to go for the slightly sexier option of an app or a web-based tool, but we know that that wouldn't be as used in our patient population as text messaging. They don't all have smartphones. Uh, we learned from our patients what they wanted before we put the program together, and then we kept it as simple as we could. I think um, another key point is that language is so important. Something that really came up from the focus group was that they they're looking for reliable, trustworthy information, and so they want um, anything that's communicated via a technology to sound professional but be understandable. Um, so, you know, they really I, we gave them examples of text messages um, and the language used in those text messages, and they really didn't like the kind of familiar teen text talk. So, although we have to use abbreviations to keep our answers within the 160 characters. Um, we really don't kind of use text slang. Um, and what we often find is actually it's a conversation, it is a chat. So we might not totally answer the, the question in just one text message, but it will be a back and forth conversation. And that gives us a little bit more leeway on, on the number of characters that we can get in there. So I think text in the city is high touch, low tech. Um, but it works with our teenagers, and it really acts in connecting them to their health home using a very simple, low-tech medium. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Melvin. Now we're going to turn it over to Dr. Sandler, who's going to talk a little bit more about what we found in finding number two related to discomfort in the healthcare setting. Dr. Sandler? Thank you. First, I think Dr. Melbourne just gave us a wonderful program that we can all replicate and implement. I think your phone will be ringing off its hook, so get ready. So let's go on to the first slide in my presentation. I would say, why should we care about these problems? So what if someone's uncomfortable in the healthcare setting? Well, the reality is we really need to care because, for starters, there's just simply basic social justice. Healthcare is something that we all need to have access to, and fortunately we're about to have access to it, and it just simply is fair. But we also need a healthy workforce. If we have people who aren't eating properly, mothers who are delivering premature babies, elders who are retiring due to health issues long before they should, we have a concern for our health force. And then the other issue is communicable diseases. We need to be sure that children in school aren't infecting each other with tuberculosis, for example, um, that those of us who are worried about swine flu and bird flu and all the other flus have some sense of assurance that we're doing as much as we can to control those communicable diseases. And equally important will be the health care costs that are saved if we can control diseases before they develop or control them at least in the very early stages. So if we go on to the next slide, please. How do we go about reducing the patient's discomfort in the healthcare setting so that they will avail themselves of the services we have to offer? The first thing we can think about doing each of us in our own way is to raise the community's health literacy, their science literacy, their understanding of anatomy and physiology, all the things that many of us on the phone today take for granted as general knowledge and you don't realize how elite we are in that knowledge until you begin to talk with people in the community and realize the gap between our knowledge and theirs. And one step to do that, for example, would be to promote healthy conversations. So one of the things that we have been doing um, in our community is to work with Asian American grocery stores. 
and recruiting Asian American students from our university who are bilingual and asking them to be trained to be community health educators. And then we're partnering with all of our Asian grocery stores in San Diego County and bringing the health messages right into the community itself, right to the people, the men and the women who often drive them to the grocery store so they have access to the latest health information. In our situation, we're interested in cancer control. And then, of course, there's a chance for a call to action. And here, for example, we've worked with black cosmetologists throughout our county, asking them to learn about breast cancer, how you find it early, what are the treatment options, what, why is it so important to have it found early. And then, of course, we have had, for many years, access to breast cancer screening and treatment free of charge for low-income women. But if they don't know that that service is there, they're not going to avail themselves of it. So we rely upon our cosmetologists to really do a call to action, to tell their clients what they need to know and then what they need to do and how they can do it. And then we ask each woman that the stylist talks to to talk to 10 more women, trying to, again, go back to that earlier thing of getting the conversations going in the community and raising the health literacy. Another way of reducing discomfort is providing resources in the community. So another of our projects has been to make cancer education videos available in American Sign Language so that our deaf community can have access to the same information that our hearing members have. We've also put open captioning on it so that someone who has some literacy skills can advantage themselves by both seeing the signing and seeing the words spelled because the two aren't equated necessarily. Uh, the sign for dog is to snap your fingers and clap your leg as if you were calling your dog, and that has nothing to do with how you would spell come over here, Fido. So those are, those are issues that we try to do to provide resources to the community. But then we also put voice over on those videos. So they become low literacy videos because they're produced in language that follows the Dolch, D-O-L-C-H, the Dolch list. And these are lists of words that you can use with confidence to create educational materials designed to reach the literacy level of your audience. So the Dolch list is a wonderful resource, and it's available online free of charge. So it's a resource that you can use to provide more resources for your communities. And then, of course, overcoming language barriers. We produce videos in sign language, but we're also producing cancer education programs in Spanish. And currently, we're trying to produce one for the Asian American community and Pacific Islander community, where we're trying to overcome the cultural barriers inherent in this community, <coughs> which has so many subgroups within it, not all of whom get along with each other and see themselves as wanting to maintain their unique identities and not merge. But we're trying to find the commonalities, including if we don't create a good program that reaches the entire community, it's unlikely that we'll find funding agencies to produce individual programs. So on all of these programs, <clears throat> as you can see and you heard earlier um, from our first presentation, we start with the community. We don't go to providers first. We ask the community, what do you need? And we work with the community far longer than we work with our healthcare providers who have the medical knowledge. But that's just 10% of the iceberg. That's just the tip of the iceberg. We need to know, what does the community think is important? Because if we're delivering a program that the community thinks is not appropriate for them, so for example, our beauticians program, they viewed that as a woman's, a white woman's disease. And it took us a long time to educate about the importance of understanding that it's actually a much greater concern for African American women because of the high mortality rate, even though they have the second highest rate of developing breast cancer. So in, in both areas, education of the medical information starts, and then we go on with the continued trying to overcome cultural barriers if you turn on to the next slide, please, we're going to merge from the topic of making patients comfortable in the healthcare setting 
to asking the even harder questions, how do we engage patients from multicultural backgrounds in clinical trials? And I'm asking you to lead from any chair you're sitting in. If you are a nurse, if you are a dietitian, if you are the person who's the housekeeper, it doesn't matter. We need to lead from any chair because we all have credibility in our communities because of the kinds of work in which we are engaged. So we have a trust relationship that is very, very unique and one that I hope you will all take seriously and really employ it. And the next slide, please, talks about how we can work smart <coughs> and win that way. When you have a research study, we ask some key questions. For example, when you do a research study, how do you know that what you find applies to every single person in the nation? What impresses reviewers when they're looking at your study? Are they going to be impressed or not? What, imp what impresses your future research funders and what keeps your own personal stress level low so that you don't have a nervous breakdown trying to do your various research studies? And there's really one single answer. And that answer is a well-diversified sample that is accrued in the time needed to reach a solid conclusion and then also to disseminate the findings of that study. So if you go on to the next slide, please, I'm going to ask you each to be thinking about what you might do to help educate each of these diverse groups. We know that a study needs age diversity. If we only have 30 to 40 year olds, we will have no idea if a drug works for 50, 60, 70, and 80 year olds where the comorbidity increases significantly and the the fighting among the drugs the elders are taking is a considerable challenge to a good outcome. Geographic areas, if we only in accrue people from urban areas, we don't know if farm workers who have had exposure to pesticides might or might not have an adverse reaction to a drug. We need diversity in our racial and our ethnic groups and our religious affiliations. One of the questions that we ask in just about all of our research studies with the community is about religion. How religious are you? And we're finding there's real correlations between religion, for example, and practices related to prevention and early detection, as well as their orientation and views toward participation in clinical trials. We've worked long and hard with our religious organizations in our community because we feel they have a key role. And they also have a key role in affecting how an individual person perceives health, wellness, and even clinical trials participation. So these are all examples of things that we need to be thinking. We need individuals who represent the range of each of these categories, not just these categories, but the, from the, the lowest to the highest age groups, for example, in each of these categories. And if you go on to the next slide, please. So what I would suggest that you do, as I'm asking you, I'm giving you a call to action, is please help us to reach out to the diverse members of the community with whom you are in contact in the course of your day-to-day -day work and your day-to-day -day living, and think about the most difficult to reach groups. Now, I'll give you an example. We had a study in which we were recruiting African American and Hispanic American women as well as Euro white women and we decided that we would only recruit African American and Hispanic women with our promotional efforts. We still had a very strong representation of white women. They just came because they heard it and they thought it was interesting and they felt that it was relevant for them. But by focusing on the two more difficult to reach groups as where we really put all of our energy, the sample was quite diversified and, and very effective. So thinking about what you can do with literacy barriers, if you speak a second language, please use that gift and talent to try to educate members of the community who experience literacy barriers and language barriers. Also think about the invisible people in our community. For example, members of the deaf community, their hearing challenge is not necessarily visible to us as we walk down the street. The mixed group identities, it's not just mixed ethnic and racial groups, but I ask questions like, if I'm trying to reach an African-American woman, how do I approach her? Is she first oriented to being a member of the black community, the African-American community, or is she more oriented to being a community of women? 
I have to start with where her orientation is, which is why it's so important for us to work with the community directly. And finally, the trust barriers are astronomical. And the folks on this call, just by demonstrating your concern for this issue, you are the real folks who can help with this trust barrier. We need to lower it so that folks are willing to come in and at least ask the question, is there a research study that I might be able to help with? Or if offered a research study, will be comfortable enough to listen to the study. I'm not recommending everyone should take part in every study. That's not, that's not at all correct. But we would like people to listen to what's being offered and then make an informed decision. So you are the folks who can help us with those trust barriers. And I thank you for your commitment to that. And I will turn this over to our next speaker. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sadler. Now we're going to hear from Zul Sarani, who's going to talk a little bit more about his experience and how it relates to findings three and six that we talked about in the Healthcare Extender Report. So Zul, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, uh, I'm Zul Sarani, and I work at USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. And, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is our patient education and community outreach approach uh, that we have developed through partnerships, and, uh, and these partnerships uh, are mutually beneficial. Um, and we started our program about 10 years ago through a service grant from the National Cancer Institute's Cancer Information Service. And even though that program ended in 2010, we have retained elements of the partnership model um, even after it ended because it was incredibly useful um, in that we had relationships with so many diverse communities that we had developed over 10 years. And we wanted to sort of leverage those to continue our work uh, in addressing disparities. Um, the next slide is, is very busy, but um, you know, developing uh, outreach and education is a tall order. And working with communities with diverse needs and, and at different levels of readiness, and so We've had to really leverage resources from within our hospital, within our cancer center, within um, the School of Public Health, uh, through intern, interns. Um, and, and that has been very, very helpful um, because we're able to then meet the communities where they're at and provide them with information that they need. So for example, um, we're able to work with our cancer surveillance unit uh, and their GIS demography division to better deliver and tailor cancer data to the different communities. So different communities have different rates. And in order for them to prioritize their work, people need very specific information. So for example, um, let's see. sorry, I can't move the next slide. Um, OK, there we go. So for example, um, we start our work with community needs assessment and really getting to understand what the needs of the communities are around our, our cancer center. And one of the things that our cancer surveillance unit helps us do is to disaggregate this data so that we're able to unveil the real problems that are masked by data that's reported in the aggregate, especially in the Asian and Pacific Islander communities. So if you look at this slide, you will see that Japanese men have very high incidence of colorectal cancer, even higher than African American men. But this disparity is usually masked when national agencies report this data in the aggregate. So this is a tremendous service to the communities that we work with when we're able to deliver this type of data to, to uh, the, for example, the Japanese community. The same with, um, for example, on this slide, you will see that um, the Samoan population, Samoan men, have very high death rates from colorectal cancer, in fact, comparable to African Americans. And if we didn't know this fact uh, by not disaggregating the data, uh, we would not be able to prioritize cancer education and outreach for this community. And so uh, um, in order for us to really do our work effectively, we've been conducting community needs assessments and looking at the data every couple of years. So we have a quick poll.
Um, in translating education materials, one should start one should first start with an English version, then translate to the appropriate languages. True or false? I'll give you guys a minute to answer that. Okay, can we have the results if they're in? Okay, great. Um, so I guess, um, you know, we have a pretty even split between the, the two and the false. And I guess, you know, um, you're both right um, in a sense that, uh, let me get the next slide on so I can better explain the reason. Okay. So really, our approach to developing materials and translating materials and working with communities is very broad. It's comprehensive. Um, we really, uh, in order to be really responsive, um, um, we, we start with community partnerships. And, and these are mutually beneficial partnerships. So if the community requires training and technical assistance, sharing of accurate data, we're able to provide that for the communities. But at the same time, in, in terms of developing materials uh, and translating materials, um, as you see at the heart of this approach is the community the, and the culture of the community, community's knowledge, attitudes, health literacy levels, all of those things that inform the development of materials. So I would say that um, a lot of what we do with materials and programs is adaptation versus actually translation. Um, in some cases, we do have to translate material, but again, it's done through an extensive review process, and our community partners always review what we develop so that we're able to, to be more responsive and effective. Um, at this point, I'm going to share uh, examples of some programs that we've come up with. So for example, Aura S is a program that that works with promotoras, and it's developed, it's a science-based cancer education curriculum. It started off as NCI's Cancer 101 curriculum with five modules, and it focuses on early detection to risk reduction, treatment, and survivorship. And the idea behind this was that if we're able to train lay health advisors, advisors who are already credible information sources as they are on the front lines in their neighborhoods, and they're more trusted than institutions, the effect of this information gets multiplied. Because when we train one promotora, she's able to educate hundreds of people with accurate information. The other program um, that I wanted to quickly talk about is STMPO, which is a research-tested campaign designed for Hispanic women to act on cervical cancer early detection. Um, it was developed by a team of researchers at Norris. And really end the Annenberg School of Communication and the Art College of Design. Um, and again, it was through focus groups, the team of researchers realized that the effectiveness of using cues to action from nature, such as the jacaranda tree, uh, which is ever present in Southern California, can get Latinas to act on getting screened from cervical cancer. And it's been an incredibly effective campaign, and, and they're just wrapping up the final phase of it. Um, and so it will be more available in the community. Another approach that has been proven very effective is testing the use of narrative film in conveying science-based messages with Hispanic women on cervical cancer. So typically, health information is communicated, communicated in a non-narrative, factual way. But information can also be conveyed in storytelling way that is compelling, and patients can identify with the characters in the story. And this could be more memorable uh, when it comes, this inf the information can be more memorable. And so when it comes to changing attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, this narrative approach has been much more effective, especially with Latinas. So we have a quick poll. 
Well, you know, I think... I apologize, Bill. Just because of um, time, yeah. we're, uh, we're coming close. We just want to make sure we have enough time for question and answer. So Absolutely. let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So I guess um, I also wanted to say that it's really important to be on top of emerging research, like this research on narrative that has just emerged and the, the effectiveness of it. And, you know, we're lucky that we have a materials development laboratory at USC that just does just that, but you know, highly encourage um, everyone to really, you know, try and look at new communications research that is emerging for ideas. Sorry, just trying to. There we go. So um, again, through partnerships with community organizations, we've developed materials in different languages. This one targets uh, South Asians, people from India, Pakistan, and focuses on breast cancer. Um, we've also worked with, um, sorry, I'm just trying to get the slides to move forward. Um, we worked with African American communities and partnered with churches and disseminated a very effective program called Body and Soul. We've worked with Pacific Islanders through Wincart Center and developed a very effective curriculum uh, for Samoans. So I just want to end by saying that, you know, um, our center serves as a direct link for the hospital to the communities because of our, of our efforts for almost a decade in engaging communities and developing strong partnerships. And I, you know, really want to thank Dr. Lourdes Baez Conde Garbinati, who's featured in the report um, for providing leadership uh, in our center. Without her, um, we wouldn't have the program and the outreach effort. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Zul. Uh, that was terrific. And thank you to all of our speakers. Now we will get to the question and answer. So just as a reminder, if you do happen to have a question, please type it into the question box, and we will try to get to it. Um, so the first question is for Dr. Malbin. What has been the most challenging aspect of implementing the Text in the City program? Ah, good question. Um, the thing that immediately jumps to mind is really getting the word out that we have the program. So um, as I mentioned, it was kind of um, getting the other providers in clinic on board. But it's not only getting them on board that you know they agree with the program and they, they think it could work, but it's getting them to tell their patients about it. And that's, you know, the, the other doctors in the clinic, the um, health educators, the social workers. Um, because we don't, um, we don't have kind of big promotional materials. We just have small business cards. Um, and at the moment, we don't really have, you know, most of the funding has gone into the actual texting program rather than into kind of big advertising. Um, so it's just getting the word out there to the kids that you know this, they can use this program um, and really encouraging them to use it. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Malban. The next question is for uh, Dr. Mark Golis. Uh, can you please explain um, finding number six a little bit more and uh, provide an example of the type of material? Um, sure. So finding number six, um, for those of you, who um, need a little refresher was that when creating patient education materials, healthcare centers involve minority community members less often than they involve providers. And so what we found was that healthcare extenders um, report that they obtain their patient education resources from a variety of sources, so advocacy groups, government sources, online libraries, but then they're also creating their own patient education materials. And so this finding really found that when they do create those materials, that they often consult with other healthcare providers, but that they don't often consult with patients or ask patients to review and give their input or things like that when creating materials. So these patient education materials could be, you know, any sort of thing. It sort of depends on the disease state or the condition, but they're the educational materials that providers or healthcare extenders are creating themselves to share with their patients. I hope that answered the question. 
Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Margolis. Um, the uh, next question is for Zul. Uh, Zul, can you provide us with any tips on how to go about building community partners who are engaged? This has been a challenge in my organization. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the thing here is that uh, with universities sometimes, you know, it's always a one-way street. We go to the community when we need something. We want them to participate in a research study or we need people for our focus groups. And, and you know, I think that it's, it's not mutually beneficial. And so um, what I've done in the past is, is I've really um, worked with community leaders and uh, identified uh, different people and tried to understand, you know, where their community is at. What is the readiness of the community? What are some of their resources within their organizations that they need? And, you know, really collaborate with them to, I mean, if they need uh, a training on how to write a grant, um, I'm available to provide that service and uh, work with them so that they're able to get resources for a program on smoking cessation or cancer education efforts. So I think um, it, it takes time. As, as you can see, you know, we, our program has been in place for 10 years, but, um, and that we've provided this mutually beneficial service consistently. Um, it is difficult, but it takes a lot of coordination, trust building, um, and definitely uh, a two-way street. Great. Thank you so much, Sul. Uh, we have another question for Dr. Melden. Um, what is the program or software used for text in the city? If you could talk about that. Cool. Um, yeah, so um, we obviously had to make something that was very secure and that was HIPAA compliant. Um, and that could potentially be used um, by lots of people. So um, we actually partnered with a company called Rip Road, who um, make a lot of text messaging platforms specifically for use within healthcare. So they're used to um, all the, the kind of rules and regulations surrounding um, HIPAA compliance and um, you know the various legal issues. Um, so it's a, an online platform. So the the patient sends a text message in from their cell phone, but we actually access that question online. So it's very much in the way that you would log into a Gmail or a Yahoo account. You know, you, you put your username and password, and then the platform that you get is um, just shows the question that's been sent in, and you respond online. And then that question goes, that answer goes back to their cell phone. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Sadler. Uh, Dr. Sadler, if we engage minorities in clinical trials, are we not in danger of looking like we're reaching a vulnerable population? That's a great question. Here's the problem. If we do not engage members of communities that are now underrepresented, we are going to be giving them medications, radiation, surgical procedures, which have never been proven effective on that community or communities. So it's a, it's a double problem. We don't want to ever over accrue or inappropriately accrue members of a community to do something that no one else would do. But here, we want to be sure we have representation so that everyone benefits from the medical advances. So if we have a new drug coming out to control high blood pressure, we want to be sure that it works equally well for members of the African American, Hispanic American, Native American, on and on communities within our nation so that each of them, each of those communities, their members have the opportunity to benefit equally. And that's really social justice, but never to the point of abusing any group for the sixth science. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Sadler. Um, one last question for Dr. Malbaum regarding uh, the parents' involvement in the Text in the City program. Do parents um, need to give permission for their teens to participate? And how do you get around that? Um, and as you can imagine, that was something that came up with um, the lawyers. Um, quite a lot of anxiety around that particular issue. But um, we're helped by the fact that the population that we see, sadly, um, 
come to the clinic alone many you know without their parents you rarely see parents here and they can come to the clinic actually it's a title 10 clinic so from 10 years old and upwards they can come on their own we don't see many 10 year olds but um, we see largely 15 to kind of 23 year olds and you know what we've really made sure of is that it's totally on the patient um, it's their own decision whether they take part in this program so it, we don't have their cell phone number and send out text messages. They actually have to make that initial move to want to use the program. Um, so in a way, that patient, um, albeit you know, sometimes a child, um, is asking the question or initiating the use of the, of the program. Um, so no um, is, is the kind of frank answer that the, the parents don't have to give permission. Um, but we see it that you know we're not sending anything bad to these kids. Any information that we're sending them is for their own benefit. Um, you know, it's good, reliable information. Um, and so, you know, a, a parent who's engaged in their child's healthcare should be happy that they're actually accessing good information that's going to help them in the long run. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Malbun, and thank you to all of our presenters. Unfortunately, we are out of time. But I absolutely want to encourage all of you to continue the discussion within Surround Health. Um, just a couple of um, last-minute items. Uh, we do have a toolkit that's available for purchase at the link below. Uh, just use promo code WEBINAR50 to get a discount. Um, your webinar completion certificate will be available in your Surround Health profile tomorrow. Uh, so please complete your feedback survey. Um, it will pop up at, at when you close out of the webinar. Uh, in order to receive your Chaser RD credit. The webinar will also be archived, and the slides will be posted on Surround Health, and you will also get a link to the archive in your thank you email. Again, thank you all very, very much for attending. We really appreciate it, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.